All right. Well, we're going to, uh, it's been a couple weeks since we've been involved in the study of the book of Ephesians. We're going to get back into it this morning. We're not going to waste a lot of time, so we've got a lot to cover. Uh, we've been studying the walk of the Christian believer, and, um, and that specifically started in Ephesians chapter 4. We've been working our way through it. Um, like I said, it's been a couple weeks since we've been in it, uh, so I'll just do some buffers to kind of get us back in tune. Uh, before we get started, though, I'd like us to go, Lord, in word prayer at this time, and then we'll jump right in. Gracious Holy Father, we come before you, Lord, with thankful hearts for this day, for the life and health that you provided us, Lord, for your great mercies and for all that you do for us, Lord, even though we're unworthy. We thank you for watching over our families, for keeping us healthy and safe. And if we've had physical challenges, Lord, for bringing us through them, we thank you for all uh, that you do and have done for us in Christ Jesus, for a sacrifice on the cross for our sins and the great uh, blessings we have in Christ, even this opportunity to come before your throne in prayer. And today, Lord, we pray that you'll bless us as we study your word, that you might bless it as it's taught and preached, that it might go out and touch the hearts of the hearers, uh, Lord, ourselves included. Um, help us to grow and mature in the understanding of your word. Help us to prosper in it. Help us to apply it to our lives in every way. Give us the strength uh, and the fortitude of, of the Holy Spirit to stand um, and to continue to strive to put off sin in our lives, even though it seems a very easy and natural thing for us to do, Lord. We just pray that you'll help us uh, recognize it when we're caught in a pattern. We ask, Father, that you'll just um, bless uh, myself and the pastors who bring some message with teaching and preaching grace, that you pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. I ask, Father, that the spirit will have full, full course in this uh, lesson this morning and the sermon as well. And I pray, Father, that you might uh, put the words in my heart and my mind um, and in our and the heart and mind of our pastor, that we might bring those things forth that you've laid upon our hearts. I ask that you receive, you'll do this for the word's sake, for the for Christ's sake, for the honor and glory uh, of yourself, and Lord, that you might just receive it as acceptable service. I ask, Father, that your word might save souls today and change lives, and Lord, that you might help us to grow and flourish uh, in your word and in your work. And Father, I just ask you'll forgive us of our sins, shortcomings, and trespasses. Please remember our request for prayer, I pray. And Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' holy name and for his sake, amen. All right, so let me go ahead and get where we're going to be today um, because this, the, oh, I already did it. <laughs> All right, here, I'm going to zoom on down because there's a lot of slides. This thing's growing. But we're going to be um, talking today. Let me get this on the screen for you. We're talking today about the believer is to walk putting off the garments of the old man. And I have on this one slide the words, the goal. And the reason I put that there is because really it's something we are striving constantly to do. We don't always do it and we fall short. And sometimes the Holy Spirit of God, he, uh, he catches up with us and he says, hey, you know, <laughs> you're not going that way. Uh, we're going to come back this way. Take my hand. And so um, that is the goal. And it's something, it's a lifelong endeavor um, to strive uh, to to put off the the garments of the old man and put on the new man, which is fashioned in Christ Jesus, and so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. It is uh, the, it, in the preceding passages. It says Paul pointed out that the old man, the unregenerated nature, must be put aside by believers, and we should put on the new man, which is received in salvation. So that which we have received in Christ is something that we should be putting on our lives. And in order to do that, we got to know the life of Christ. So we have to go and we have to study about Christ and see the things that he said and the things that he did. And I'll tell you, if you're, if you're walking and talking like Christ, you're doing, you're doing better. <laughs> you know, if that's your goal, if that's what you got before you and you've got that measured out, you know, if you were to go um, in the book of Matthew and listen to the Sermon on the Mount or read the Sermon on the Mount, uh, my Bible app lets me listen to it. So that's why I said, listen. But um, anyways, <clears throat> there's a lot of things there. If, if we could do that, we would be doing real well. And that's really, um, but then let's just look at all the things he did and how he did it. And the, 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 meaner, the, the meaner that he had when doing those things, it, it was oftentimes a, a very high mark. And so we are not Christ, but we strive for that mark. Um, and, and 
the new nature which is imparted through the new birth must be cultivated, thus causing the old nature to be subdued. So the more we cultivate the new nature, the more it'll naturally subdue the old nature. You know, it's it's not by coincidence that whenever we're studying God's word, we're we're not doing it as much in our head or in our heart that's contrary to God. We're, we're kind of captured or caught away by the scripture and we begin to think on those things. Um, when we're in God's house, I mean, we may be thinking about the pot roast and things like that. You know, because the adversary, he likes to get up in our heads, you know, we're, when we're in the house. But um, but really, for the most part, we're listening to the word and it's uplifting our hearts and our souls, causing us to feel joy. And I usually leave here full of joy. And that's because it's subduing my my natural nature, which is contrary to God. So the more we are uh, cultivating the spirit, the 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 new man inwardly, the more we're causing the old nature to be subdued. One's uh, conduct will be very noticeable and very positively affected. So when you begin to put these things on, because it's not the nature of of the natural world to do these things, I'm not saying they don't do them. Of course, a lot of people that don't know the Lord do a lot of good things. But I'm saying this will be a consistent pattern for us that will be recognizable. Um, There's a lot of uh, efforts by believers to do good in the world, and that should be their goal. So we're going to read the scriptures right now, and and we're not going to cover all these this morning for the sake of time, but we're going to probably get into the first four, and we'll probably break the second four up next week. But we're going to read them all because I think it's important to read them first, and then um, we'll get into breaking them down. So it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through 32, it's, and, and this is the foundation, so l- let's pay close attention to this. It says in verse 25, wherefore... Putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceedeth out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. In other words, including malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And that was from the King James Version. And I like this picture. It's actually a painting. And um, I like it because it, it depicts putting on the new man, uh, which is fashioned after Christ Jesus. So putting away the garments that are, are old and not, uh, you know, ho- they're, they're, they're full of holes and dirty and putting on that new whited robe, which is representative of the nature of godliness. So all these verses basically come down to five aspects of the new nature. So if you were to read, go back and read all those verses, they're representing five aspects, like facets on a diamond that represent the new nature. And they are, the, they are as follow. Be truthful, verse 25. Be peaceful, verses 26 and 27. Be respectful, verse 28. Be helpful. Verse 29, and be spiritual, verses 30 through 32. So we should be a people that's truthful, peaceful, respectful, helpful, and spiritual. All right, so that's what we're going to be looking at. They make up the basic outline or groundwork from which to build the Christian character. And so if you want to know what brings God on glory, what is going to look different in the world, what is going to be beneficial to the individual, this this little passage that we're looking at here is a really good starting point. Now, I, 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 I'm saying that because it is, but it's, you know, ultimately looking at Jesus himself is always the best place to start. Um, but as you get through your study in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can, you can couple that with the book of Ephesians. Because I've always said the book of Ephesians lays, not only does it lay the premise by which to walk, but which is like the first three chapters, but also how to walk, which is the last three chapters. And so it's really, if you can do um, the last three chapters based on what is revealed in the first three chapters, in other words, that's the purpose for doing it then you'll, you'll do well and you'll prosper in the Lord. Of all people, people, believers should be truthful. 
Okay, so that's to be something we practice. We're talking about practice. I can't say that word practice, and that don't come to my mind for all you basketball aficionados out there. But we're uh, anyways. Sorry, I get caught away with, with my own mind. It's it's in other places sometimes. But um, anyways, the fleshly nature does not readily embrace truthfulness because the devil is the father of lies. By our nature, by our sin nature, we don't embrace naturally truthfulness. It's something we really uh, make effort to do. There's a lot of times you might be in a situation where you could stretch, twist, you know, fabricate the truth a little bit to your liking. And that would be natural. And that's because our nature is that way. It's like a little kid. A little kid will naturally just, did you do that? Because they fear the discipline. They don't want to get found out. So it's, if you you watch them, they'll just naturally like, no, depends on, you know, how you define it. (laughs) Uh, You want to embellish your question a little bit there and Maybe we go have an answer for you. You know, kids find the, find ways to move around things, a lot, and that's that's the nature. And we just perfect that as we get older. But it says in John eight forty four, "Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do." He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he seek when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So really. Our natural man has been perverted by sin as a result of the sin trespass, and which is passed on through the seed of the father. Um, it's natural for us to do that which is by nature, that nature which we have received because of our trespass against God. And, and lying is definitely one of them. Like I got this picture up of Pinocchio. Um, and the nose, and I like this picture because it's not only is it a really neat little picture, but the nose in this one is long. And there's, there's times in life when we may have a really long nose, but the goal is to get that guy back in line and, and bring ourselves into subjection. You know, sometimes telling the truth is not an easy thing, and it can also affect um, our outcome. But I'll tell you what, I'd rather speak the truth and, 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 and deal with the outcome than to lie and live with it. So be truthful. Uh, verse 25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. So do not lie. The verse opens up with the wherefore again, and thus linking what is going to proceed or what, or what proceeded with what it's going to follow. And so what proceeded? Well, believers in verse 24, it says, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, so now what he's going to say is you, you had an old nature and in Christ, you now have a new nature, put on that new nature, which is um, after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, and he's beginning to instruct on how to do that and and showing them the things that that outline with what that looks like so that they could identify what they needed to do. And again, we're talking about the Apostle Paul writing the church at Ephesus. And keep in mind that this church was, I'd say would be in Turkey today, uh, probably on the west, south, uh, or east, south end, um, and it was uh, it was pretty close to the ocean, but there was a, it was largely um, a Gentile people, and so they had these practices in the Gentile culture which were very pagan, um, and so they were trying. What he was trying to help them, he was trying to bring them along from that which they grew up knowing to that which now um, should be what represents their life. And so the word lying is from the Greek word uh, pseudos which basically means that which is untrue, deceit, falsehood. It's from where we get our word pseudo. Um, If you go to work, look up the word pseudo, it would basically give you that definition or um, a version similar. So lying is from that Greek word pseudos, which is basically that which is untrue or deceitful or a falsehood. Um, Like we said, the term is used with many English words to denote something which is false, fictitious, deceitful, or counterfeit. And so a lot of times you say, oh, a pseudo leader might be a false leader. Or, you know, we'll put that pseudo in there to say 
that what we're going to reveal following is false. This represents a falsehood, uh, even though it's a, it may be an individual or it might be a thing or a word or whatever. Um, and so we use it a lot and maybe not even really know what it means, but there, there it is. The purpose of lying is to give a false impression or to mislead someone. And we do it all the time, a false impression. In our fleshy nature, we do it almost effort, effortlessly and an embellishing is a form of it. So sometimes we, we don't call it a lie. We just embellish the truth. We've pushed it or stretched it out over this way so that we mislead the hearer with regards to the truth because we've embellished it to some degree or the lie to some degree has been concealed somewhat by our embellishing. And so that's a form of it as well. But it's but we need to be truthful. So we need to not lie. We should be truthful. Now, the exhortation about lying is broad. It covers a large uh, scale of things. And sometimes our lies can not even be words. It can be actions. You know, we can act a certain way. They say a lot of people are like, um, oh, the, the word I th theater um, actors are what they used to be referred to as hypocrites. Because they were putting on a mask and they were acting like someone else. But that wasn't the true. Well, sometimes we can just act a certain way. And, and even sometimes we get labeled as believers or Christians as being actors. Because we're acting this way here, but differently out there. And that would be a true statement if such were the case. So we should be truthful. Who we are here should be who we are out there. And that's hard, I know. And it's a stinger because we don't always do that. And that's because we're, we're, sin, we're, sin, we're sinful by nature and even by practice. We've, we've honed our skills. And so it's really a lifelong endeavor. And so I'm not here to beat people up because I'm, I, you know, like I've told you, Paul said he could be the chiefest of sinners because I wasn't born yet. Um, you know, and we might say, well, I didn't do everything that Paul did. But you know what? We're still guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. So in a lot of ways, we're murderers. Because he had to die for our sins because of our sin trespass. So we're no good by nature. God is good by nature. And so the, the application is to bring the now indwelling spirit to allow him to, to drape us in godliness. And to do that, we have to pray. We have to study. We have to con constantly make effort to push back against the efforts of our flesh to bring us into subjection and, and try to push through to the point where we can... Just, I don't like to live in tomorrow. I'm just trying to get through each moment. Each moment is a crossroad. Um, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, each moment is a crossroad. And I had a lot of crossroads this week. And I remember telling my wife, I said, this thing or this thing was a milestone. Because in my mind, I accomplished it successfully. So to me, it was a milestone, something I had to overcome to get to a, the spot I wanted to be. And you can probably relate to that because I'm sure you experience the same yourself. But we... The, the exhort, exhortation about lying is broad. It covers one's conduct as well as his or her actions or words. Um, um, but the admonishment to speak truthfully with one's neighbor is more specific. Okay? And here's the stinger. <laughs> Neighbors and other close associates know how we live and conduct ourselves in our relationship with them. Thus, the admonition. So there's no one that probably knows you better than your close associates and your neighbors because they see you coming and going. They hear your words on a more continual basis, your coworkers and things like that. They see a greater snapshot. I, I, I might spend more, almost spend as much time with my coworkers as I do with my wife awake, you know? So they see me every day, almost. Thankfully, not on the weekends. Too much of a good thing is not necessarily a good thing. So anyways... Since neighbors are more readily able to discern a lie, to mislead a neighbor could very well involve a greater degree of deception. And there's the admonition. In other words, we have to go the extra mile to deceive someone who knows us really well because they see us every day. It's harder to deceive them. And so greater the lie to do so, greater the effort, greater the web that's been weaved to, to, to cloud the view from that thing which you're concealing. And so the admonition is be truthful and, 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 and live your faith. Um, and that's, some people might see you live in your faith and say, well, that's not good. But then again, if it's in line with the word of God, 
then it's going to be a good thing. It's going to be the right thing. And that's what we need to try to do. I like this picture too, because it was the one I thought best to <laughs> explain what's going on inside when there's a moment of anger or rage. Um, I mean, I, I, I see that guy and I'm like, Hey, Scott, what's going on there, buddy? <laughs> you know, no, I, I don't know. But I, I just, I just, I liked it. I think it depicted it well. We are to be peaceful, a peaceful people. Uh, verses 26 and 27 says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Be angry and sin not. Some people have concluded from the opening statement of verse 26 that believers should never become angry and to do so is sinful. Understand, that's not true. That's not what Paul meant or wrote, okay? He didn't say, if you are angry, you are sinning. He said, be angry and sin not. So there's a place for anger. And we got to understand that. It's actually, if you experience anger, it's, it's likely something that God himself was understood before he ever applied it to our, our capacity. So all the things that we experience, God fully understands and has the capacity. I, I know God was angry with the nation of Israel on several occasions. There was a point in the scriptures in the Old Testament where he repented God that he ever made man on the face of the earth. You see? So this, this is something. Now, did God sin? No. Because what he was, what he was feeling was truth. It was true. What we had become as mankind was a debacle. It was a mess. And it was everything that was contrary to God. So it repented him that may, he made man on the face of the earth. And so very true and very real perspective. There are times when it is appropriate for one to become angry. Christ was angry on occasions during his ministry, during his personal ministry. And you can go and read Mark chapter 3, verse 5, and you can see it there. And you can also look in John chapter 2, verses 13 and 17, where he cleared out the temple, overturned the money changers, uh, pushed them out of the temple because he was, he was angry over the way they were treating the house of God. And they made it a place of money exchange and selling as, a, as opposed to a place of worship. And he was angry about that. And it was just that he should be. So when godly principles are uh, reviled and wickedness is promoted, righteous indig indignation is in order. However, a proper response is also in order. See, the thing that, that made Jesus perfect is the response was proper in each of the situations. The first one that I, I gave you, uh, I think it was in the book of Mark, um, Chapter three, verse five, he's frustrated and angry about the lack of faith or the, the lack of understanding, but he goes on to heal as a, even though in light of it, but he was still frustrated with those times he was frustrated with the Pharisees or angry uh, because they couldn't understand something that was so easy for, for them to understand, especially being Jews. And so he'll express, and those are, those are not referenced here, but there's, if you study the gospels, you'll see stuff like that, where he's, he's expressing frustration. Even call him whited sepulchers, who's on the, on the outside is white and clean, but who's but but inside are dead man's bones. <laughs> so he could see, and 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 it was it was something that would frustrate or it would challenge his righteousness. And so, but there's a proper response that that needs to be in order. For example, it is certainly appropriate to to be opposed to abortion and even speak against it in truth. However. It is wrong to murder abortionists and to burn down abortion clinics. Okay? One's anger over sin, even a heinous sin, should not cause him or her to assume the role of God and seek to inflict vengeance. And the reason why is because it, vengeance doesn't belong to us. All right? We may be opposed to something, and we might not even like it. But a wrong response is still a trespass and a sin against God. And so we should be, we can speak about it. We can, we can, and preferably in truth, I am not an advocate of abortion. And I can tell you why, if you ask me, okay? Um, because I think life is valuable. And I see that baby as life. God made in the womb who doesn't have a choice. 
who has no say. You think that if that baby was born and, and reached consciousness and could answer for itself, that, that it would want that? Would you? You know, so no, I'm, a, I'm vehemently opposed to it. There's other avenues, you know. Now, there's circumstances, and I'm not going to get into that, but I'm just saying my position is I think it's, it's ungodly. So there you go. I like this picture that's up, but I'll explain it in a minute. Here's what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 says regarding vengeance. For we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. There's really two things that's being said there. The bulk is that vengeance belongs to God and he will recompense. And he will also judge his people. So to me, that's a pretty strong um, statement that's been made there. And so really, we got to trust one thing, and that is that God is in control and that he doles out discipline or um, or I'll say judgment upon sin or those things that are wrong. And, and, and that's really his, he's taken that for himself. He hasn't given that to us. Okay, so that's not ours. So that brings us to this. No grudges. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. You want to have a healthy marriage unit or a healthy friendship? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Okay? Work through and get it resolved. Okay? It, I'm telling you, if you go to bed wrathful, you're going to wake up wrathful. You know how much energy that takes? It takes a lot of energy to, to, to carry a wrathful spirit. Because honestly, it, it, it generally anger burns off pretty quick. It's us that resurrects it and keeps it alive. All right. So naturally, it'll kind of burn off. It'll go its course, but we want to keep it alive sometimes. So no grudges. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. This means that anger should not be nursed or nurtured. <laughs> There's people that they'll plant that bad boy. They'll water it. They'll prune it. They'll pull those fruit off and they'll keep that guy growing. You'll be five years down the road and you still don't know what you did. And their trees as big as their yard now. That's not what God is, is requiring of his people. He had a different view in mind. Ideally, when anyone becomes angry, the matter is dealt with as quickly and as calmly as possible. Which means when you come to that place where you can work through it, work through it. For me, I, I, I have to process things. I'm one of those people that I internally process it for a little while. And then I'm going to say something. I'm going to speak. And, and that, I, that's when I get to that point. I'm ready to, to let it out and reveal it, what's upsetting me, and then work through it and explain. And, and sometimes, you don't. the person that you're talking with, they don't, they don't care. <laughs> it's like, hey, I don't care what you think. This is where I'm at. Okay, well, in those circumstances, if the nature of the problem is beyond personal differences, one might have to be content to simply turn the matter over to God and leave it with him. Great place to leave something like that. Matter of fact, start there. Start going to God first. And, um, and by the way, uh, let me go back. This picture that had the guy doing this with the face in jail. I wanted to say this. I was just thinking about it. When you carry a grudge... You're the one that's in prison. You're the one that's in bondage. You're the one that's suffering. Why? They always say the saying is, life's too short. <laughs> you know? Some things you can't control. Why carry that? It's a better thing to release it, to let it out so that it's not weighing you down. It's like lead blocks on the leg, you know? Anyway, if the nature of the problem is beyond personal differences, turn it over to God. Let him, let him take control of it. Leave it there and let it go. There's sometimes people have trespassed friends of mine, and, and I ask them about it, or they are talking about it. And, and they said, well, the person never apologized, but I, I'm past it because I was able to forgive them in light of their non-apology. An amazing spirit displayed there, that they went to forgiveness before they ever received an apology. Because God was working in them to not let it be a thing of offense. And so they were already further along than the trespass, which is great. The Greek word for wrath, and this is interesting. <laughs> uh, the Greek word for wrath in this verse is 
par, I'm going to struggle with this, parorgismos, parorgismos. And if you look at how it's spelled, par, orgis, mos, it's from a basic term. So if you go and you take, you could take this word back to its basic root word, that root word is orge. And it's from which we get our word orgy. So orge is the root word for parogismos. If I've said that correctly, I probably butchered it. But anyways, you get the point. That's why I put it up there because I knew I was going to probably mess it up. But it's from where we get the word orgy, orge. When anger is nursed, it is likely to result in explosion of inappropriate and even shameful actions. And usually regret follows. And that's why I like this picture here because it pictures to me a person that's thinking about something that they regret. And I like that he's looking up um, in the picture. But this word can be applied in a lot of different ways. Unfortunately, when you hear the word or gay, you ha have a tendency to go one way with it. But really, it's 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 describing activity that is inappropriate and even shameful. Um, and it usually follows with regrets, no matter when you're involved in it. When, when, in this case, it's used as the word wrath. And, and wrath is the result of nursed anger. So we've brought ourselves to the point now where we've nurtured it to where we explode. And it's, it's inappropriate and even shameful. And generally, once the explosion's done, or anytime you participate in orge, there's usually regret that follows. It doesn't bring a positive result. No opening for Satan. We're running out of time here, but I'll, I'll try to move quick, so I want to get through this. No opening for Satan. When one allows anger to cause him or her to sin, the devil is given an opportunity to cause that sin to scatter into all directions. As a wildfire driven by powerful winds, uncontrolled anger can quickly spread from a single individual in a confined, in combined, or confined circumstances to many people involving widespread situations. So you know this, when, when we allow anger to even turn into wrath, it usually involves a lot more people and a lot more complex situations. Verse 27 said, Never, uh, neither give place to the devil. And here's, here's the point. Satan likes to fish in troubled waters. And he is not above troubling the waters himself if given the opportunity to do so. If you start to nurture and nurse anger, you're giving him an opportunity that he'll take advantage of. And like, like, like I said there, he likes to fish in troubled waters. He's happy to fish in those waters. Because he can mess. There's a lot of fish in those waters too, generally. So anger is something we need to put off or strive to not allow to be a part of our character and our way of life. Verse 28, the final verse for this morning. It says, let him that st stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands that thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. I love this passage of scripture because if you've ever, do they say it's better to give than to receive? It is better to give than to receive. The, the wonderful thing about sharing with those that don't have the opportunity to uh, experience whatever it is you're sharing is it makes you feel happy. How many people really even count, count the cost at that point? Do you? I, I don't know of anybody that that is naturally involved with sharing or giving that even counts the cost because they've come to a place in life where they've learned that it's a greater joy then, you know, it's a greater joy than rather experiencing it yourself than to see someone else experience it. Have you ever taken someone that has never been to Disneyland, to Disneyland, or taken someone who's never been to a place, to that place? You're seeing the same thing they're seeing, but you're more excited about them seeing it. And you're more excited about it. This year, uh, my wife will be going deer hunting with me out of state for the first time. I'm more excited about that than I am the deer hunting. Because she's never seen these things that we see when we take these trips. So, and my son-in-law and, and daughter, my son-in-law and my daughter and my, my son and my daughter-in-law are going as well. So it's going to be a different scenario for us and we're excited about it. 
So it's better to give and receive. And, and let's start by addressing the subject of stealing. No more. Steal no more, but rather labor. So believers should be respectful of the property and possessions of others, obviously. It is wrong to take something, uh, to take some things that or that's something that belongs to another person, whether it is tangible thing, such as money, or something intangible, such as time, or someone's reputation. Can you take time from somebody? <laughs> Employees do it every day. And so we shouldn't be a kind of people that, that robs our employer by stealing time from him. We're paid to work. We should work. And, and I say that, and I'm guilty of it. So this is to me, too. So I'm not pointing a finger here. I'm thinking about myself. It should be, I got to do better. You know, say, you ever see the, the, the people that they're, they're on these social media apps and they'll, they'll, they'll highlight someone's comment and they'll say, so-and-so, so-and-so, do better. This isn't becoming, do better. Well, it's not becoming. We should do better. And that should be our purpose or our strife. Um, stop stealing. Not only are believers to be honest in their speech, but they are to be honest in all their dealings and, trans and transactions. Anyone who has put on a new man should not yield to such behaviors. There are many ways someone can steal from someone without using a weapon or breaking into a home or a business. One is guilty of stealing any time he or she obtains or receives anything by theft, cheating, overreaching, underserving, or cutting corners. Now, my business... Cutting corners is absolutely the worst thing you can do. There's a lot of people that'll take drawings and they'll hold them and say, that weighs about, they weigh about 50 pounds. That's a $5 million bid right there. <laughs> 50 pounds, 5 million. We don't, we don't do it that way. We count every nut, bolt, screw. All the engineering's done. We know it's exactly needed and that's how we price the job because to do so otherwise would put our, our, our employer in jeopardy, in harm's way. Because we cut corners, we left them open to loss. So underserving means we're not as productive and we're not able to do the things that we should be able to do in the time frame specified. So all these things are a form of stealing. Ask the question, does God approve of how I deal with others in my personal dealings, business, professional and financial transactions? Does God approve? Is he pleased? Can you say when I've done this thing, would God be approval? Would I have his approval? Start working, it said. Instead of stealing, one should be willing to work to provide the necessities of life. The Greek word for labor denotes hard work or intense exertion. It literally says by the definition, be wearied. <laughs> so you know what work is? It's work. It's not play. I can play all day, but it's hard to work. And I don't work in the field. I don't work a laborious job. I work in an office. And sometimes I come home wearied because my brain is hurting from my job. And there's times I come home and or in my job where I've literally like um, had so much stress that my pores are oiling. Do I feel like I'm just... And, and, and you have to just kind of have some time <laughs> to unwind and to kind of let it out. Um, so like with my work, a lot of times the guys will go through these stages where they're working really hard. We try to shut them down a little bit, meaning make their load easy for a little while so they can catch themselves. Because it's that, it's that intense um, each and every day that they're trying to put their bids together in the time frame that they're given to do it. You know, a, a, six, a, a $30 million job in three weeks is a big ask, you know, four buildings, all kind of stuff on it. That's, that's a hard ask right there, but they managed to do it. So they're going to burn their candle really bright to get there. So it's to be wearied. This covers mental exertion as well as the physical efforts of one's labor. They are, to, they are both included in the term, physically or mentally. Exert oneself. Working is from the great, uh, basic Greek term ergon, which indicates activity designed to produce something. So working is activity designed to produce something. Because there's a lot of work out there that's not designed to produce anything of any value. 
The expression, the thing which is good in that verse refers to that which is beneficial or wholesome, like a profession or trade. A lot of people spend a lot of time building their profession or trade. They put a lot of work into it. And I've seen people that have gone literally in our offices that have gone from answering the phones to project managers. They didn't get that way because they didn't put it in the work. They didn't get that way from answering phones to being an estimator because they didn't make effort. Some people go from mopping floors to managing the business. Why? Because they worked hard, because they made effort, and they were rewarded as a result. I believe God rewards that kind of effort in the lives of believers and unbelievers because it's a good thing to work hard and to benefit from it. Now, the big difference is what we do when we benefit from it. How do we use the benefit? Are we distributors or are we hoarders? And I really think God's people should have should realize at some point that we're like God was a distributor, we should be as well. Le- learning to use the blessings of God from our hard work to benefit others. Robbers and swindlers often work hard, but their labors do not benefit anyone. In fact, are usually detrimental. <laughs> they work hard. You know how many how many people are out there trying to scam somebody and they put a lot of work and effort into trying to scam them and it's destructive they don't care about the lives they're destroying so it's not beneficial to anyone and really be honest honestly it's not even beneficial to themselves because in the end they're never going to be satisfied satisfied and really in the final end they're going to suffer loss help others The benefit for one's working is to be able to give to him that needeth, verse 28. 1 Timothy 5.8, a very strong statement says this. Note, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. (laughs) Woo. That's an eye opener right there. So we have work to do, and we should be about doing it, and we should do it with the right frame, with the right attitude, with the right disposition. And that right would be a godly disposition. Jesus had work to do. He satisfied everything that the Father asked of him in every work, every, the whole part of his ministry. He fulfilled it all so that he could say, it is finished. And God could say, well done. And as a result of the work of Jesus Christ, Christ has been given recognition. All power, authority, glory is bestowed upon him because his work was perfect. He fulfilled everything and he provided for humanity. So that's our example. That's what we have to look to. To work to provide the needs of others lends greatness to the humblest occupation. Think about that. The work to provide the needs of others lends greatness to the humblest of occupations. You know, there's a lot of people that work in places that no one ever sees, yet they're providing for others. What greatness? What? It's, it's a thing to be looked at honorably. And, and some people say, well, yeah, but they work, so-and-so works. And I'm like, yeah, but they're working and they're providing. And that's honorable. I, I respect that. Which brings me to my next point. One whose life and actions are governed by a keen sense of responsibility is certain to occupy a commanding position in the esteem of others. I have this saying that I like to employ. It's called, do we have, am I in that person's choir? When I really respect someone, I'm in their choir. I'm singing. Oh, I, that person's really good at what they do. I, they work hard. They're smart. They, they, they put everything in this certain order. I'm, I'm singing in the choir. Oh, you know, because I, I admire the way they work and the, the type of work they produce. I esteem them. And it don't matter the position. I could see someone that has a lesser position by society standards, but I'll admire the work they do when they do it well. And I think we can all appreciate that. We, we like to get things that's made by good workmen that have taken the time to craft it. I've, I have some items in my collection that are, whether they be shoes or shirts or whatever, I admire a good shirt. I want something that's made well. I'll go and fill it. 
I want to feel the material. I want to see the stitching. And I want to buy it. I'll pay more if it's made well. Because I esteem the quality and the workmanship. Finally, a duty shunned or delayed is a duty still. You know? Why put off for tomorrow what you could do today? It's just going to be, you're just going to add to tomorrow. And then you're going to bury yourself. Few people are few people are recognized as being great, but anyone can be true, just, honest, faithful, even in small things. And that's really the Christ spirit. That's the Christ mindset. Even though his wasn't a small thing, but he recognizes. Some people are in places of service for God today that no one ever sees. You think God's not going to recognize them? No. You'll know who they are at one day and you'll see their works because God will glorify them for it. So keep that in mind as we, as we close out the lesson this morning, I'll close our lesson in a word of prayer. Loving Holy Father, Father, we give you thanks today for this day that you've made. Lord, we thank you for the words that are in this epistle, Lord, for us to look at today, for the generation we live in where we have your word, to be able to study it, to grow in it, to allow these things to influence us, Lord. And I know it's tough and you know we struggle. We go through each day and we deal with our emotions and feelings and some, sometimes and perhaps oftentimes we allow them to override what we should be doing or saying. Father, give us strength to, to overcome. Convict us. Tell us that we're in a place we shouldn't be and give us the strength to move out of it. Lead us out, Lord. If you got to take us by the hand and walk us to safety and put us back in a place that you would have us to be, then we pray you'll do that. We pray that you'll work in our lives that you, because you, you've already shown that you're the great, you, the great workman. You just uh, have constantly been working for us all the way through time. And Lord, I just pray that you'll, you'll move in our lives to bring us to that place you want us to be. Give us the strength and fortitude and courage to stand there, Lord, and to walk that walk. It's not easy. Work is not easy. The Lord will rejoice in it. And peace will come. And we know this. And Father, we pray that you'll receive the honor and glory for every little thing, every little decision we make. Each moment that we have it, let us choose the right way. Let us choose the best way in Christ. Father, I pray that you receive the honor and glory by it. And I ask that, Lord, you might just continue to guide and direct and keep our families healthy and safe. Watch over and bless our church, I pray. Please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for your time. Oh, you.